Well, this episode title is a little meta, meaning I am actually the voice for fitness. It's my business and it's been voice for fitness for, I don't know, more than 20 years. But I want to talk to you about becoming a voice, a voice, not the voice, not me voice, but a voice for fitness. And that is involved in your videos, your podcasts, when you're talking from stage, when you're talking to somebody in the grocery store. And it's so very important. And you may not realize it because we cannot detect our own voice quality in the same way that somebody else can. This episode is going to deep dive into it. I'm Deborah Atkinson, and you're listening to She Means Fitness Business. It's a division of, yes, you heard me, Voice for Fitness, my business. And at Voice for Fitness, we all know that you want to be an inspirational example to other midlife women. To do that, you need a health healthy, profitable health and fitness business. And the problem usually is lack of clients or a lack of revenue because maybe it's you run out of time or that you're charging too little or both. (laughs) And that'll make any of us feel uncertain about whether they can really sustain this. Number one, the effort without burning out and whether you really want this lifestyle, if that's what it takes. You know, we believe you deserve consistent, dependable revenue from clients you love working with. And I know exactly how it feels to have the intelligence, the knowledge, and have the heart to want to help women, but feel like I, it's just around the corner and you keep having to run toward it, but it moves further away. It's why I train fitness pros and health coaches internationally, and I have for 25 years. It works like this. First of all, we start generally with a call to make sure we're a good match, but we get you clients, number one, and make sure that they're systematically coming in regularly. The second thing we do is make sure that from those clients, you're getting some profit. You can't be just getting by. You got to have a little bandwidth so you're loving life because that will make you a more creative entrepreneur. And then three... We also want to make sure that we save and spare you time to enjoy that revenue, right? So it's all three have to happen right away so that you can feel like you can exhale. And then that's when things get really good. So I do want you to book a call. If you are ready and you want to take a step forward, it's time to do that. If you're serious, this is, as I'm recording, it's mid-August, literally mid-August. And look, if you are not prepping October, November, and December for a crushing it next year, you're behind. I, and I hate to say that because, you know, anytime you're going to start is better than not starting at all. But it's so very true that the last three months of the year are going to predict how successful your following year is. Now's the time to do it. Use the t- statistics that you can pull together, scramble up. Even if you don't have your own, we have trends now from 2023 that we know probably and can project what's coming in 2024 and what customers or consumers will want. Now's the time to get started. So even before you book a call, I want you to go and get the business scorecard I created for health and fitness pros. In two minutes, you can look at it, assess for yourself where your biggest holes are, where are the gaps, what do you have, what do you not have, and where are you forgetting to focus? Because every single day that you might be telling yourself, I need more clients, I need more clients, you may also not be doing the things that get you more clients. So let's do that. All right, let's jump into this. And I want to tell you this, and I want to tell you this because I think a lot of people are doing more video, which is fantastic. I think a lot of you are maybe starting your own post it or podcast, which is also fantastic. But I also want you to be a real voice for fitness. And this is so meta in, in more ways than my business is called Voice for Fitness. But I want you to be a voice for fitness, meaning the voice, the advocate for the kind of fitness principles and the avatar, the ideal customers that are your people or who whose people are you, right? I mean, you want your customers when they get to you and your community or your groups to say, oh, I found my people. She gets me. That's exactly what you want to be. So when I say to be a real voice for fitness, 
you know, we are also now going to talk about the literal voice, your speaking voice, the quality, the tone, all of that is really the topic of this conversation. Because I think we can all admit that sometimes listening to a certain speaker might feel like fingernails on a chalkboard. And I hate to say that because I know for some of us, I'm a visual person and that just makes me get chills, not in a good way. And there are other people whose voices are like butter. And I think I find myself saying this when I when I am talking to somebody, I'm so distracted sometimes on a podcast when I'm talking to a guest whose voice is just like, I could listen to this all day. And I can't, I'm telling them afterward, I'm like, you know, if this gig you're doing right now doesn't pan out, you should be, you know, some kind of a speaker because it, you got a voice. It's amazing. So there is a huge difference. And I think we want to do everything we can to embellish our voice. Listen, your voice could be replicated and substituted by AI but it will never replace an entire podcast. It might replace a word that you misspoke. Those kinds of corrections are already here. But to be a real voice for fitness, an advocate for health and behavior change, your voice quality will matter. As AI-driven voiceovers may be able to make you sound better than you actually sound, this may be a podcast whose time is past, and yet I think you can make your voice become something that conveys confidence, authority, and simultaneously inspires hope and action steps in your audience. I bet you would say, yes, please, because that's what people are looking for. They are looking for a guide and they have to have confidence in you. And one way you relay that is by your conviction, by your voice. And that happens to be in a certain tonal range where it's much more like music to somebody's ears. Cliche, yes, but true. And the truth here is that there are voice qualities that make it difficult for people to want to listen to you. Maybe that's true for you. Maybe it's not. Maybe you're lucky. If you want your voice to be music to someone's ears, there are things that you can do. And one obstacle you'll have to overcome is awareness to it. It's nearly impossible for you or me to hear our own voices as somebody else does. And definitely when we're speaking, we have very different experience than anyone else might who is hearing us. The input for us as we speak is coming through a combination of our skull bones internally and through the air externally. So what we hear sounds nothing like what they hear when you record your voice. So ideally you play back your your advertisement recordings, your podcast recordings, the interviews that you've had with other podcasts, you play back or hear yourself on a video. And every once in a while, I will catch myself like accidentally, I'm scrolling through a timeline and don't realize my sound is on and it'll play out loud. And it's like, oh my gosh, that's so alarming. I don't want to hear myself. <laughs> and I've got to stop and say, well, you know what? I need to hear myself, what did I sound like? And sometimes it's, what was that room like? Or what was it like for me? Because I was outside recording and was the wind too bad or poor or were the acoustics in that room bad? And you want to know those things, but all things we're going to consider today. So definitely you want to take a look at this, a 2005 study. I know this was early and usually relevancy happens at about 10 years, but this has been studied so much that it's more common knowledge to those who study it. So there's not a lot of new research about this. But back then, we knew our own reality of our voice tends to be much different than what other listeners hear. We're more harsh judges, actually, of ourselves. So if you hear your own voice and you are just like, oh, my gosh, this is terrible. <laughs> we tend not to like our own voices. So cut yourself a little break. Do listen to your own voice, your audio or video, and realize we have a unique experience in listening to ourselves to compare to anyone else's experience. 
but I think you will still gain some value. And I also think it's probably most valuable if you can listen to yourself doing an interview, not simply you talking solo on a podcast or on a video. But if I were, say, in an interview with someone else, it gives me the juxtaposition to hear what do I sound like, my voice quality to their voice quality? How do we complement each other? And even better if you can do two or three. Now, I have only done, I think, ever probably a handful, fewer than five episodes where there have been two guests on. It's a little tricky, certainly tricky if you can't see them. But you do want to pay attention to, okay, how do I sound relative to these other people? I think that's really good for getting a real feel, not just a, oh, I hate my voice kind of thing, but you can hear relative to something and that just gives you a whole different stance or angle. So here's how to be the voice, your own, and how to fix your flaws. So let's just assume that none of us is perfect. How can we improve if there's something that you don't love about your voice? And and I would suggest you listen to feedback. So number one, if you've ever heard anybody say, it's hard to hear you, speak up, or um, a, some mean girl, and it's almost always a woman. Unfortunately, not everybody has gotten the message that we're being nice to each other now. But often a mean girl will say something like, I can't stand to listen to a voice like that, like fingernails on a chalkboard. <laughs> then listen, a little, just a little. And I that quote, that example, I did not pull that out of thin air, friends. People have somebody has said that to me on a YouTube channel of all places, where it's like a free for all, and it's like, why did you stop and waste your keyboard typing time, even to leave that mean comment? Just go somewhere else. I I don't quite understand everyone, but. You don't have to be the voice for everyone, just for those who are going to love working with you. So you've got to let some of those roll up. And if you have 188,000 followers on YouTube, think about them and not the one right who, who left you the nasty, mean comment. And sometimes sound quality can be fixed, right? With the combination of free, low cost, or higher investments, even voice exercises. And I'm going to give you some of those right now. So if you discover, or if you know your voice isn't as smooth or as strong, as convicted as you'd like it to be, what can you do? There are some ways to improve what you're doing. And one of these things I want to, I want to tell you that we're really dealing with several things here, right? So I'm talking about quality of your voice, like clarity. You know, I listened to a podcast earlier today, actually, while I was on a walk, and it was an interviewer who I enjoy listening to her podcast on a regular basis, and she had a guest on whose voice was not clear. It's almost as if she might have had a cold, or I felt like she needed to clear her throat. And, and it might have been sound quality, and it might simply been that is her voice, period. And she can't do a thing about it. But that means there's a real distinct difference in is there something that you can do? Because if you want to be perceived a certain way, do you know what it feels like when you go to um, a dance recital or piano recital, for that matter, for you know new beginners? And they're up on stage and you're just praying they get through it. They don't even have to be yours, right? but you just want them so badly or you go to a high school play and they can't remember their lines and you know it and it's, you feel bad for them. You don't want anybody to feel that way for you. And I think you want to be conscious of what's your rate of speech and what's your tone of voice and how much do you bring? Like, do you really bring energy and are you conveying the kind of message that you want to? Because I don't think we want to lull anybody to sleep when it comes to health and fitness habits, do we? I mean, if we're talking about something from prevention of of a cancer and we're talking about getting screened or we're talking about 
certain foods or, or BPA and exposure to hormone disruptors, we want people to take it seriously. And if we are simply listing things off in a very quiet and calm voice, because that may be your demeanor, you may want to take a good look as is that what I need right here? Like you may in your notes, if you're using them for a podcast or a video, you may want something on that prompter to say energy right here. I need energy. I need to punch it. So did you hear what I just did? So if I'd had that cue, then I would have done it. But if you are just reading along and you're reading like bullets, you might not and you might let it go. And you might say, I have three more of these to record today. If you're batching like I do, you cannot lull yourself to sleep. And then by the third, just kind of be dropping off like because your posture is not good anymore, because you're getting tired and you want it over. You have to really find ways to tip into what energy do I want to bring and what do I have to do to get that? So I want you to think about what kind of confidence do you exude? Do you give that to people? Because you may be very kind, maybe a very kind person, and you want to be very respectful, but you can respectfully say, you know, look, you know, this is something we've got to take serious. This is not something that you can just let go. And you can still bring it in your voice respectfully in your personality. But there's a combination of things layered when we talk about voice. So in addition to get feedback to fix your flaws, you also want to get a better mic. That might be something you need to do. So back in 2012, 11 years ago, when I first started podcasting, I started what was then, I called it the Voice for Fitness Professionals Podcast. So it was the business name, it was the name of the podcast, and it's evolved since then into Fitness Marketing Mastery was that, and now it is She Means Fitness Business. So we're really not only changing the name, but changing the niche so um, gentlemen who are here, I love you. You're welcome to be here, but we're really catering to women, females who are trainers and health coaches, particularly those who might be in midlife who are helping that woman in midlife herself. That's who this is for. When I first started podcasting, someone told me the best mic was the Blue Yeti and I got one. I mean, literally I was like, okay, I'm in. I need this. It's going to be good. If it's going to be good and I want a high quality podcast, I'm going to get it. I didn't have a clue about what I was doing. I mean, really, I didn't have a clue about how to podcast, like how to put it on Libsyn. I mean, like that was first an ordeal when I had to get that set up, right? And somehow I managed to do that on my own. I'm quite proud of that to this day. But one of the reasons I'm reluctant about leaving because I feel loyal to, to Libsyn. So there I am. I didn't have a clue about any of it, but I bought the Blue Yeti. And I knew if I was going to get a podcast that was going to be listened to, it had to be great sound. And that thing is way more reasonable today to purchase for sure. And actually, I had to retire mine because even after careful packing it up from move to move, it was not producing the kind of sound that I needed it to anymore. So during the pandemic, the entire podcast setup for Voice for Fitness changed. And you may want and you may need now a mixer and headphones and a high quality mic, but at the very least, you want a high quality microphone and a room set up for acoustics for some people. That is a closet. And and I'm not kidding you. A closet is often one of the best places to record because you've got a buffer. You need carpet on the floor. You need things on the walls. I have, I'm in a room with full of bookshelves and filing cabinets. I have um, photos and art canvases on the walls and a lot of things in here that absorb sound. So the quality is really good and potentially is pretty good when I'm just recording, say on a Zoom in this room, to the microphone in the computer and not using a high quality one. So I will give you my tech deck set up for both video, um, including on my phone, and podcasting 
or for audio recordings and what I will use for a multitude of things, whether it be on our website, in our membership site, or on podcasts at the show notes for today. So if you want to get that, that'll be at fitnessmarketingmastery.com forward slash voice for fitness, forward slash voice for fitness. That'll probably be a little tricky and it'll get me into trouble, but hopefully that'll get you to the right place because that's the business name. I know. Okay. So if you want the list of all the items, again, as part of my setup from platform to check, stay tuned till the very end. I will share those as well as they'll be in the show notes. So what else can you do to improve your voice quality? Like take the voice you have now and you ordinarily speak with and make it better. Some of the same things that make the difference behind a richer, more powerful voice are also going to target your pelvic floor muscles. Any hints? Do you know what this is? It's breathing, deeper breathing that comes from your diaphragm supports your voice too. Those of you who are singers are probably naturally better podcast voice because you're already doing this. You're probably already better diaphragmic breathers. And now I will tell you a shock. Just because you're fit and you have great cardiovascular fitness, just because you have a great core does not mean you have good diaphragmic breathing, my friend. There are plenty of exercise instructors who breathe from their gills, meaning their upper back and their neck is constantly tense because they're breathing very shallow into the top one third lobe of their lungs. And we're not breathing into the bottom two thirds, which is really what you need to do. You can do this with me if you want to take a deep breath in, take your hands, splay them like open, like duck web and put your thumb on your bottom rib and put, you know, one of your fingers might be your little pinky, might be your ring finger on the top of your hips and sit up straight and inhale, expand though low, not raising your shoulders. And then on the exhale, blow out like you're blowing through a straw. You keep blowing out. I can't blow out and talk. Okay. So keep blowing out. And I want you to keep blowing out beyond comfort. Like you're going to feel like you're going to run out of air and even get to the end and kind of cough and sputter a little bit. But can you feel your diaphragm and your transversus abdominis is firing? Now, Take a deep breath in. Don't hold your breath. Don't let it out, but don't let go of the muscles. You've identified them. You can hang on to that. Now, are you squeezing like you're going to stop poop or stop a fart? No. And I know potty mouth, but there's no, that's the best way to say it, right? You don't have to do that. You don't have to do a Kegel, but you're actually activating your pelvic floor. That diaphragmic breath by inhaling deeply and exhaling using your diaphragm. When you speak, that's how singers get more out of it. They hold on to those long notes because they practice that kind of thing. So I want you to practice that. And you may be doing planks all day, every day, but if you're not doing diaphragmic breathing, your core is missing the foundation that it needs. Even you, fitness pro, and so is your voice. Singers sing and cheerleaders project from their diaphragm. And you should too, even when your mic is two inches from your mouth and you could whisper, you should still be using your diaphragmic voice right now. Okay. So what else you can do is cheat. (laughs) Use the audio adjustments that are available to you in your iMovie editor, or if you're using GarageBand or some other fancy smancy movie editor or audio editor. I don't know if anybody's using GarageBand anymore, but this isn't ideal because sooner or later you're going to be asked to speak. I'm hoping, right? I'm holding that out for you. People are going to start saying, could you come and speak to our group? Whether that's a virtual presentation or that's an onstage presentation. Well, when we hand you that microphone, We want a strong voice. We don't want something that's high and like this. We want really something that is a little bit deeper, that has a little, here we come to it, right? Y'all better pay attention. You don't want to be in that high place and you'll get there if you're not practicing. It doesn't mean you have to suddenly get a 
dead a tenor or a bass voice or go deep, but we all have a range. We can all drop those notes and we can hit high ones. They don't have to be very pretty, right? For some reason, I don't even have a pretty range. I don't, I didn't get born with that gene, I think, but um, you want to find where is it that you can push And that when you get a microphone and you are amplified, that the sound coming out of that is pleasant that someone wants to listen to. And I'm going to give you a couple ideas for that too. So tips for a better voice when you are speaking. Number one, hydrate. And I I know that's an obvious thing for us who exercise, right? But you may not think when you're going to go and do an interval training at your podcast recording or you're going to record a batch of videos, you also want to be well hydrated before you get there because all that talking is going to dry out your throat and you want to have something close by. Now, there's, you know, you're going to say, what is tea with lemon? Is that good? You know, potentially if it works for you, but mostly hydrate, hydrate. Posture. So sit up, sit up tall. I just did. You could tell because my energy got better, right? And you also might want to alternate. So today I am recording actually three podcasts, had to do also a few ads. So I sat. This is the second little stint that I'm sitting through. I'm going to stand for the next one. So I'm up and down and up and down and not doing the same thing for any of them. That's important or try moving if that's not possible based on maybe you're tethered to your desktop, you can't go anywhere. Try moving for a few minutes between episodes. Go do, you know, jumping jacks or go do 30 seconds of this, take a little break, move around again, change your posture so that you get more energy into your voice again. Now, if you're creating workout videos, your energy will naturally stay higher. It's, it's tons easier to keep high energy while you're doing exercise videos. It gets hard when you're doing educational videos, but you need to bring the same kind of energy. They can't see that you drop energy. That's really an important distinction. Smile. Now, of course, there's topics you may be talking about that are more serious. If you have a guest on or you're talking about breast cancer, you may not want to be smiling. There may be something within that episode that makes you smile, but it may not be a a touchy-feely. However, your intro and your outro should be like, you know, a welcome friend. I'm so glad to see you again. I'm so glad you're here. And I hope you could hear this smile in my voice. And that's what you want them to hear as well. There are also warm-ups, and this is something that actors do before they go on stage or speakers before they develop a speech. And let's face it, if you're doing a video, whether it is exercise, it's yoga, it's meditation, or you're delivering a podcast or doing an interview, you are going on stage. So you too should warm up just like la, 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 warm up your tongue, uh, ta, 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 da, 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 ba, 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 pa, 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 pa. And that tends to be problematic, right? When peas pop, like stop it, right? So if you can hear me doing that, you may not like it. So there is also an S, like if your microphone or your mouth is too close to the microphone, you may find that S's are not comfortable. They tend to be a problematic vowel. So you want to, you know, practice and listen back and practice some more. But articulate is such a good word to practice with, but articulate, 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 right? And you can also do things like tickata takata, tickata takata, tickata takata. So you're making your tongue work quickly over the words so you don't trip on them. Inevitably, when I have to pronounce names of people that have challenging names, it's the worst thing in the world to have that responsibility where you've just met somebody. You really want to be respectful and you cannot pronounce their name to save your life. I don't know why it happens to me, but in the green room, when I practice, it happens really, really well. And then sometimes I'll get on air and I'll be like, I- I'm so sorry. <laughs> so sorry. I do that. But you you have to figure out a way to practice 
help yourself not trip over your tongue. And it's ticket a tackata, ticket a tackata, ticket a tackata. Or you can just do Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers over and over and over so that you get yourself untongue tied, essentially. Practice that diaphragmic breathing. I mentioned earlier, remember that hands on your belly and your abdomen in front of a mirror, if you can, or your computer screen, turn your camera on so you see your shoulders do not rise. You instead fill your belly, inhaling there, exhaling through the straw so you can feel your diaphragm con- contract on that exhalation. And then know your script. So I don't know how you do your podcasts or your videos necessarily. You may do it by bullet points and then elaborate. Honestly, that's probably one of the easiest ways. That way you're not oh, reading, I lost my place in line, and then you kind of trip over it. And that is where, um, um, that's where that comes in, right? That's not ideal. And there are AI things that can take those ums out. And it's very easy for you to, yes, pay for it, upload it, have them remove the ums and the ahs and send it back to you. And there's even a program that will uh, create little clips. Like you pick out the clips. It's not intelligent enough to pick the good clips out, but you highlight them like quotations and it'll pull them out and create four little clips for you for that show, for instance, to share. So good. So think about where do you have money to invest and is that one place But you want to know your script or use bullet points so you don't have to read. You don't have to have those pauses like, um, um, what else was I going to say or what else was I going to ask? Because even what I just did in demonstrating that, how much did you just like, oh, I wish you wouldn't do that, (laughs) right? And you you kind of like, oh, she's going to say, um, one more time, I'm going to scream and I'm turning it off. Exactly. So you really want to try to get used to finding what is your filler. We all have some. Mine would probably be okay, so, mm -hmm, those two words, one or the other, or both. So I have to, see, I did it again. Just kidding. I did that one on purpose. But I do have to catch myself. I think it's Steven Spielberg has a book on writing. It's just O-N and writing. And it's brilliant. He really, in that book, he's not telling a story. It's not one of those like It, Chucky or anything else. He's actually talking about how he writes. And one of the best quotes in it is, I leave out the parts that someone would skip. Pretty brilliant. So anything that someone would assume that they would come to the conclusion on their own, leave out, but also in a speaker's case, leave out the ums. When you've watched the best speakers in your life, the ones that you remember, you may not even remember what they said exactly, but you probably remember the emotion they created on stage. And I can remember with some of the best speakers that I've seen on stage, not just the times they were talking, but the times they paused. Their voice was so strong, so convicted, so rich in imagery that wherever they were at the moment, I was there. I heard the survivor from the airplane crash in, I can't tell you where it was, but it was the rugby players from the book Alive. I think we may have all read it in seventh grade. Do you remember that one? I heard him speak. And when he was on speak, I honestly, right now, I I have chills telling you about it, remembering being in the audience because my imagery of that event through his voice and story was so vivid. I was there, but he didn't speak without pausing. And it's sometimes your power is in the pause if you have a strong voice. And the difference is if your voice is not coming on, you may 
have them worried for you if you pause. They won't realize it's on purpose. And you absolutely want to buy yourself that time, but you also want to buy the power of the pause. Because if you've said a thought that you want them to have resonate and live with them for a very long time, you need to pause after it. Or if you are about to say something that they need to listen to and remember, that is another place to put a power pause. But the pause, the emptiness has no power if what came before it and what comes after it are not strong in conviction of a voice with certainty. Okay. So next, some really good rules when it comes to speaking. Sound when sound and quiet when quiet. What? Like, yes. So here's my thinking on that. When you are talking, just like I mentioned, when you're doing it solo, so on stage or on a podcast telling a story, pause just like that. But also more importantly, when you're interviewing a someone or multiple someones, it gets tricky. Try not to step on toes. I have a hard time with this still. If you listen to any of my podcast interviews, my podcast, you'll notice, is audio only. We don't do uh, video for a couple of reasons. Number one, the logistics for a lot of guests, they can't book as quickly if it's got to be video because video means a shower and makeup for most of my women, not for the guys. But that's a little more challenging. And people can book fairly quickly if it's audio only because they can do it in their pajamas. And they're like, yeah, okay, let's do that. Let's do it as quickly as possible and get it going. But I also rarely turn on video even just to see my guests while we're on. And part of that is bandwidth. The sound quality is better. I'm, I have no worries whatsoever about my internet or the guest's internet because we're not using video. It seems to make things go more smoothly. We don't, we don't really have any glitches or drops or issues with production during. So it's harder not to step on toes or voices. I find myself in the middle of a conversation, if I'm with a friend, if you were talking and I might, I might just say, mm, mm-hmm, you know, and I would give that nod and that encourager. It's good. It's actually quality conversation when you're a counselor. And I went through a lot of counseling training and exercise psychology courses. But the whole thing is that if you are a listener, I'm doing an interview, my guest is talking, and I say, mm hmm, yes, yes, in the background over their voice, I have disrupted your ability to clearly hear what they have to say. So I have to stop it. Right? I have to be quiet and stifle myself, essentially. And there are times when I do that because I am going to interrupt. Because I might have a guest who is a uh, a run on train, you know, a runaway train, and I can't get them to take a breath. I've had a couple of guests like that. I've had a couple of guests that don't realize or listen to me when I say, "No, it's actually a thirty minute show ish." So you notice we're going a little bit long for this one, but I will have to stop them at forty five minutes and say, "Uh, yep." Yeah, we, yeah, I'm sorry, we're going to wrap it up now. This last question I'm going to ask you, but I have to interrupt them to ask it. So do, however, most of the time make sound when it's sound and be quiet when it's quiet. Try video, even when you are doing an audio podcast, if you know that that will work for your guest and where they are. And they're in a really quality place. I would never do that with somebody or personally when I was traveling and in a hotel room, because in my experience, the internet is terrible and it doesn't work very well. So I usually do voice only. 
Um, and if, you know, I'm up in the mountains, I was doing that a lot when I lived in Boulder at 8,800 feet, very unpredictable, better here. Um, so know who you are, where you are, and your guest as well. And then also leave it out instead of, um, or, you know, do you do something else? Do you have another kind of a filler? I would suggest that you just start listening to short recordings of yourself giving responses. I do voice messages for myself a lot. I don't know why, but while I'm in the car or on a hike, well, I do. Creativity is spawned by movement. I get great ideas. And so I will record a quick voice message to myself and I'll play it back, but especially the ones where I'm in the car, probably visually distracted by the road, by what I'm really supposed to be doing and hands on the steering wheel and, and foot on the gas pedal. As I'm recording a message, I find, oh my God, like, do I have a cognitive disorder or what? Cause I'm pausing and I'm umming and i realize how much I have to pay attention to what do I do when I'm actually on a podcast? Do we make every word count? And for today, I want to point out the fact that some of the ums and some of the ahs and some of the awkward pauses, some of this were on purpose so that you could distinguish what was a really high quality sound versus not because the only way that you're going to start to discern this with your own ear so you can do it for yourself is to hear it among others. So I highly recommend listen to radio talk shows, listen to podcasts, and listen to recordings of yourself and see where are you in regards to what you want to be. Who, who do you want to sound like? Okay. As promised, I want to give you my tech sound or my sound tech tech deck for your health and fitness content creator. So number one is the basic, and this is really from most to least important, depending on what you're doing, but it's the room. It's carpeted, surrounded by bookshelves for me on all on three walls. So I've got lots of sound absorption coming in. Now the door to the hall goes to a room where it's tile floor. There's, you know, one big couch, but it's a big room, high ceiling. Closing the door actually makes a difference in the acoustics here. So think about all the details that you've got. I use an iMac uh, desktop, and that's what I used to record on as opposed to my laptop, which that for a long time was what I did. And I would just sit down, I would plug into my laptop with a microphone. And that's no longer what I do. So I upgrade it during the pandemic. But please realize I've been doing this since 2012. I've monetized my podcast, so this is not just a, a marketing tool that I'm putting out there, but there is a way that there is revenue coming in from this, so it's justified. So I'm using a, about a 24-inch iMac um, desktop, and this one is uh, pandemic old, so I think it's one, one and a year, one and a half years old unless the last two years has gone really fast. I also have a mic. It's a Heil Pro uh, 40, so H-E-I-L. I have a mixer, and that's Focusrite. It's a Scarlet, um, and Scarlet is the brand. It's uh, Focusrite is the model. But what I want you to know about is, so I'm wearing also headphones, and they're, they're Sennheiser HD 280 Pro, all the details will be in the notes so you can look it up. And I'm not giving you any affiliate link. I'm just sharing with you what I have. But the purpose of the mixer is like the headphones go into the plug into the mixer. The microphone plugs into the mixer. The mixer plugs into the iMac and kind of spits it all out. And so when I'm talking, whoops, I hit the filter to the microphone. Sorry about that. When I'm talking, I'm hearing myself in my ears, ideally the way that you're hearing it. But if I were just 
listening to the ambiance in the air, it sounds very different. And that is where you and I can't really hear and discern the quality of our own voice it's in the same way. We don't hear what others hear. This way I do. I hear it a little bit better. I hear the quality of my voice. And when I'm listening to my guest, I hear them a little bit better. It's like they're right here with me. And that's a little scary sometimes, but actually really good. Okay. My podcast recording platform for those who are on a podcast or thinking about it, I'm using Zencaster.com. It's Zencaster, not like it sounds because there's no E-R. It's just uh, Zencast and then R.com. You can do video, you can do audio, you can do both and then separate, post them to wherever you want to. And post-production goes to Dropbox. So it's super easy. Um, what I would say about that is I have been encouraged by some other people who've used Zencaster and then gotten off to try something else. And I'm just reluctant to leave. I am so loyal. It's loyal to a fault almost. So I kind of riding out the storm and it hasn't been too stormy. I've been with them almost since they began, but, uh, Riverside, is another suggestion. Okay. So that's the other one that I'm often recommended by friends as something that you might want to try. The podcast platform, the third party platform where you load your podcast up to the site from there, it is then loaded to up to 80 different hosts like iTunes, like Apple, like iHeartRadio and Stitcher and all of the 80 places where people get their podcasts like Spotify. What I use is Libsyn. And I think I mentioned earlier, I've been with that from the very beginning and the basic level I went next to um, professional and that's where I'm at now. So we have the ability to put on ads if we want to And um, I'm loving that. For post-production, like what happens post-production? Because you don't hear the whole thing necessarily. If I'm with guests, we stitch things together. So I will record a show intro after I interview a guest. And so we stitch that together with the original interview part of the podcast. And sometimes I also will do a separate outro, but all of that is put together behind the scenes and not by me. So it's not a good use of my time to be doing that in the beginning. I do a lot of those things all by myself because we do, right? We wear the hats and you decide where you want to invest money. And that wasn't where I wanted to invest my time and money. Um, because your time is worth money and there are things that only you can do. And if I would have spent my time doing that, I would have gotten a much slower start than I did. So I use a team of contractors. I put together a system and, you know, every once in a while that's up for, do I want to change that? Is this still working the way I want it to? And as there are more and more podcasters out there now, everybody's starting a podcast you know, it was really easy to grow in 2012 and 2014 and 2016 and 2018 and 19. And and then in 2020 and 21, everyone starting podcasts, it's more crowded. There's more space. And that doesn't mean that those of us who have longevity and consistency, and we know I'll be here. I'll be here because that's who I am. I have consistency. Nobody's going to out consistency me. Yep. But you know, that doesn't mean that I'm growing as quickly as I was because everybody coming on new, it just gives, oh, I'm going to listen to that this week and I don't have, you know, uh, an empty bandwidth of time to listen to podcasts. So choices, 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 and as choices increase, it's going to reduce, you know, what any one individual has. That's natural. So you want to think about, you know, where you're putting your time and where you're really going to not spread yourself thin, but you're going to choose one thing. You're going to go deep in it and you're going to go hard and you're going to go smart with it. So a microphone for video with my Sony camera that I'm using for video. So this is not, you know, like a quick HD camera. This is um, literally my Sony Alpha 7. So the microphone that I use for that is a Rode, R-O-D-E, 
Rode Wireless. They've been around forever, high, super high quality. So that is a wireless, meaning there's a battery pack that goes on my hip and then a, you know, a lapel that you fish up through your shirt. And then there's one that goes into the camera. And both those need to be working with battery. Always works better. You don't want to be in the middle of your video and have it cut out. Had that happen several times. Not a great thing mic for video with my iPhone. And I should clarify here, I have that in the notes with phone. I'll put iPhone. I It's a Rode wireless. I have that. So there's one specific for that. And I have a smart mic. So I have both. Actually, I probably have a couple couple other lapel mics that I use with my iPhone. And I don't love any of them, quite frankly. So sometimes they work. Sometimes they'll connect with Bluetooth. Sometimes they won't. They're finicky. And honestly, I find the biggest and most important thing still is being in a room with good acoustics. If I have the microphone on and I'm in a room with poor acoustics, I will sometimes still get from the mean girls, mostly just the mean girls, poor comments about or comments about poor audio. Like this would have been so much better if your audio was good. Like don't you have other things to do today? Is what I want to answer, but I say thanks for your comment. Every every comment helps. So, something that you might like to check out and that is descript.com. I mentioned a little earlier that there's something that can take out the ums and the ahs. This is it. And there is a free, of course, but guess what? You only get to upload like five minute video. So if you've created something short for literally a short or for maybe a very short upload for your timeline on Facebook or on Instagram, you may want to try it out by using that. But to get an hour, you have to use at least even the lowest paid. I think the per month on that was like 24, 25 bucks, probably straight up. And that was probably monthly based on an annual membership. So probably a little bit more if you just want to go month to month and try that out for a bit. That is what I would do. Just in case you're wondering, um, almost anything that I start and I don't know that I love, I will do on a month to month basis first, asking before I get started, if I want to upgrade to annual, do I have that option at any point? And then what I will do is, okay, I'm going to get in on just a month to month. I'm not going to commit to monthly on an annual basis yet. So just food for thought. So when you're really budget friendly, you want to look at, or budget conscious, you want to look at budget friendly things. That's the way I would do it. That way you're not in for life. You can just get in, get started, and then get out if you should need to. The show notes for today, I know really long, but there is nothing more important. We spend our lives teaching, talking, your voice and the conviction in it and the fingernails on a chalkboard or the butter in your voice makes a difference. And there are things you can do, you personally, physically, and you in terms of what are you ready to invest in that could make a difference on the front end and then on the post-production end. All the way through, there are things that can help improve. Show notes will be at fitnessmarketingmastery.com forward slash voice for fitness. What are you waiting for? The world needs you right now more than ever.